Uh, I always like to start out with a story. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, <laughs> Rhode Island specifically, I was 10 years old and my mother passed on. And without a second thought, my father's parents, my grandma and my grandpa, they just moved in and started taking care of raising me and my sister for several years. So these are very special grandparents. I mean, I know all grandparents are special, but this one actually gave up quite a bit to help raise me and my sister in a crisis. Fast forward several years, I get out of undergraduate, I've been accepted to law school, and my grandfather passes on. This was only two weeks before I had to load up the car and drive out to law school. So my grandmother, being a very proud grandmother, my grandson's going to law school. She gave me one day for orientation and then started asking me questions about the estate. As if I walked through the door and just everything dumped into me and suddenly I was this famous attorney. It's like, well, I learned very quickly that no matter what question you ask a first year law student, they're always gonna give you the same answer. And the answer is, no matter what the question, I don't know, let me look it up in the law library. So my grandmother kept calling me, it was an average about every two weeks or so, with a question about the estate. And the reason she was asking me instead of the attorney is every time she called the attorney, she got an answer that she couldn't understand in a bill. So, well, my grandson kind of owes me, and that's, that's fair. <laughs> So I'm running around getting answers to her questions, and it suddenly dawns on me that it's a year and a half later, and she's still asking these questions, and I'm like, does this happen every time somebody passes on? And apparently, in a lot of cases, it can not so I'm running around the law library then trying to figure out, once I'm out and I'm practicing as an attorney, how can I prevent this stuff from happening for my clients so they don't go through what my grandmother did? And that's when I found something called a revocable living trust. There was a book called The Living Trust by this guy, Henry W. Apps III. And I got to this book by going to the head librarian. He said, oh yeah, this is exactly what you're looking for. This is the book. We don't have it. And he sent me across the street to the mall to actually get it at the bookstore there. And that's when I really kind of dedicated myself in my future practice to helping people avoid problems ahead of time by getting things squared away. So that's really what we're kind of talking about today. So let me just take a quick poll. They're not going to see on the camera. How many people would prefer that the government decide things for them and have a government process to do it? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Nobody. Okay. That's kind of what happens if you're not putting in place your own documents. And the fact is there are a lot of documents out there that can put the power back into you and also empower the people you want to make decisions and handle things for you in a crisis. So that's really what I'm covering today. And we've got 45 minutes. There's no way I'm gonna talk about strictly legal documents for 45 minutes. So I will take whatever questions as we're moving along. I'll try to make sure we're covering everything. All right, so there are what I call the big five documents. These are really the basics that every adult should have. The first one, this is a last will and testament. So that's what most people hear about for estate planning. It's the last will. It's when I pass on, I want this. I mean, you probably see on TV this big dramatic thing where the attorney's reading out the will. It doesn't really happen like that. But the will lists who gets what, when did they get it, here's this percentage, or here's this thing held in trust and whatnot. The will controls all of that. So you can put in place ahead of time the main things. Here's who I want my executor to be. This is the person who's going to make all of this stuff happen, wrap up any finances <coughs> you have, and make sure that everybody gets what they're supposed to get and when. And you're, then you're listing out, here's where everything goes. 
there may be a couple of miscellaneous things in there. I've seen attorneys put things for if I have any minor children, here's where I want, who I want to be guardians and things like that. Here are some specific burial information, wishes and things like that. But that often goes into that last will and testament. So that's the document you hear about. Now here's the one thing that a lot of attorneys who handle the same type of work my grandmother went through for my grandfather's estate, the last will and testament means probate. So if anyone has ever said to you, Oh, I have a last will and testament. My estate doesn't have to go through probate. No, that's entirely wrong. Probate actually is here's what we do to execute that will. And so there's the court process. Now let me ask, has anybody here been an executor or administrator for an estate? Okay, so you've seen all the paperwork that has to go into it. You have to list every single account, what the balance was exactly on the date of death. It's not just, oh, well, the statement said, here's what it, no, you need a written statement from the financial institution. Here's what the exact value was on the date of death. Then every single bill that gets paid, funeral bill, uh, outstanding credit card debt, all of that stuff, <laughs> You need documentation in terms of here's this invoice for it, or here's the statement. Here's the check that was written. Here's a copy of the canceled check afterwards. And everything has to balance down to the penny. How many people like that exercise? Okay. Here's the one thing that I found. Engineers and accountants think probate's no big deal. I don't, it's just something with the way their brain gets trained for what they do that they think probate's no big deal, and for them it isn't. For most other people, it's being an executor is kind of considered the worst part-time job you're ever going to have. Okay, so, yes. Well, no, uh, no, you do get paid. Yeah. You do get paid. They can, usually the benchmark is somewhere around 5% of whatever the assets are that are in probate. Now, that's a lot if you really think about it. Now, when you talk to the heirs, and there are attorneys that'll do this, well, look, we've got some paperwork you can make us the executor or the administrator. We can handle all of it for you for 5% of the estate. They're going, well, okay, we're still getting 95%. We don't really have to do anything. Okay, not a bad deal. You tell my clients at the planning phase, oh yeah, you're gonna give up 5% of everything you've worked your whole life for just because we need some paperwork. They're gonna go, that's crazy. And I agree, especially because it's that process that generally lasts. Now, I can say six months to a year and a half, it's usually a lot closer to a year. I've seen some very simple estates get wrapped up in six months, but sometimes there's just stuff that pops up. But when you have that last will and testament, it's kind of saying, yeah, we want it to go through probate court. We're going to talk about an alternative in, in a minute, but this is at least that one of the five basic documents that you want to have. Second one, now we're talking about during life and if there's some kind of crisis or someone just needs additional help. It's a financial power of attorney. The ones we use, the technical term, it's a durable general power of attorney. And this is where you're saying, here's this person, I want them to be able to do all these kind of financial things on my behalf. They can do banking, real estate transactions, uh, pay my bills, uh, if there are any kind of outstanding benefits that you might be entitled to, they're representing you to make those applications. They sign everything for you. Now, you can limit stuff, but the way I kind of look at it with my clients, I try to keep it easy. Look, if you're trusting this person enough that you want to make them your power of attorney, don't start in with, well, they can do this or they must do this. They shouldn't be able to do this and get really detailed. It's like, no, you're trusting them or you're not. So if that's the case, they can't marry you off to someone or divorce you from someone. Uh, they can't vote for you and they can't enlist you in the military. Other than that, there are some exceptions, but it's a very broad power. But that may be exactly what you want someone to be able to do if you're in a position where you can't make those decisions and do those things yourself. So that's the durable general power attorney, the second document. 
third one is the healthcare power of attorney. So now we're getting into making these healthcare decisions for you. So again, very, very broad. Anything that you could authorize or do for yourself, the healthcare power of attorney is going to be able to do that. So it is a powerful document, particularly if it's in a medical crisis. So again, very broad healthcare powers and decisions that they can make on your behalf. Fourth document. This is what most of my people jump to when I start talking about who do they want to be their healthcare power attorney. They go, oh, I want so-and-so because they will pull the plug or they won't pull the plug. We're talking about you're at that very final stage and the doctors have said, look, there's nothing we can do. But we can keep the body going on the machines and the nutrition and the hydration and keep our fingers crossed, knock on wood, have a miracle, maybe something will happen. Most of my clients go, look, if I've reached that point, then please just let me go. That's the living will. So that document takes that decision off your health care power attorney. You want them to be able to do everything else, but believe me, there is an awful lot of guilt that lingers if they <coughs> actually have to make the decision. So that's most of my clients that's like, yes, I am trusting my daughter to make all of those decisions for me, but I don't want her to actually have to say, yes, quote, pull the plug on. So that's where the living will has you making your own decisions. And then the last one, we're going to talk a little bit more in depth on this one. <coughs> it's a nomination of conservator. And this is if you get to the point where a judge is stepping in or someone's bringing a legal action because someone needs to be legally in charge of you, then here's the people that you want. Now, the way I put this together with everything else, it really shouldn't be necessary. Because you have a financial power attorney, you have a healthcare power attorney, you've already named people in this. Why should a court have to get involved? Remember when I started out saying, do you want the government in charge of making those decisions? Do you want a government process? Guardianship and conservatorship is government process. It's a judge saying, oh, well, this person is better equipped to do this than this person because they didn't make any decision. Wouldn't you rather make those kind of decisions ahead of time yourself? Yeah. So the nomination of conservator, I call it like a defensive document. It's gonna list exactly the same people in your financial power attorney to be your conservator of the estate. And separately, it doesn't have to be the same people. Here's the list of people that I want to be my conservator of the person to make the healthcare decisions for you. So if we're lining them up, a judge really has to have some kind of solid reason to not just go along with those two powers of attorney. And usually it's something like, well, okay, we, we see the power of attorney is actually stealing money, or there's weird stuff going around, and the court needs to supervise it. And if that's not happening, well, why would you want the court to have to say and look at all that stuff? Now, how many people here have heard, oh, we're just gonna go and get conservatorship over someone? Have you, have you heard that? Because I've talked with a few people and they just, it's like they're jumping right to, well, okay, I see this a lot uh, when there are children and they're turning 18. And it's like, well, they're gonna need extra help. And if I talk with the bank, and they say, once they're 18, they're an adult. I can't do anything. And they say, go down to the courthouse. You can just get a conservatorship. Okay, that means you are getting the court involved. Not just now, but in the future as well. Every single year, there has to be some kind of accounting for everything. So that conservatorship isn't just a one-time thing where you go in and yes, okay, that would be the conservator. 
you have to keep records that are exact, the court approves and says, yes, this is okay, or no, this isn't. You need to put your own money in because you were abusing your court oversight every single year. I have a client that they had to do this for her son. He ended up in a car accident and it was a, a brain injury. And he didn't have any documents in place. And so they had to go to court, get that conservatorship. And she's like, it's just such a pain. They paid an attorney to actually handle all those filings and paperwork for about six or seven years. And then she's like, this is just too expensive and it's using up my son's money. I'll do it myself, but now she's having to do hours of stuff. And she had to hire a bookkeeper who was familiar with the process. Anyway, why go through it if you can put in place the documents to avoid all of that stuff? All right. Any, well, let me go one more kind of bonus document. If you have minor children, or you're actually the legal guardian for somebody else, then we typically also put in a nomination of guardian for that minor child. So this way, if anything happens to you, your wishes regarding here's who I want to actually raise my child, that's put in place. So that's kind of the bonus document out of the, the big five that makes it six. All right, any questions on any of those before I get into the revocable living trust thing? Yes? Just have a comment in reference to a banker saying go get a conservatorship. I've been in a banker for over 30 years. Yeah. I don't ever take legal advice from a banker. <laughs> oh, God. I've had a lot of say run-ins. Is there a more polite term than run-ins? With bank personnel telling my clients to do something, I said, no, 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 don't do this, do this. They go, oh, the attorney doesn't know what they're talking about. You need to go and do it. A couple of cases, uh, I was actually doing Medicaid planning. Now, I'm not going to talk about irrevocable trusts and Medicaid planning in here because the next session with financial planning, I'm going to be working with Mike. He's going to talk about some long-term care and other things. I'll go into that later. But I had clients moving hundreds of thousands of dollars into irrevocable trusts. I told them exactly how to set up the accounts so it works with the trust. And the banks, same bank, two different branches, two different people, told them, oh, don't do that. Do this instead. That's giving legal advice. That's actually doing estate planning. And they got it wrong because what both banks told my clients to do would have put all those assets back on the table for Medicaid to say, yeah, you have to spend it down. So it, this is actually in my engagement agreements that, hey, if any financial institution starts telling you to do something else, you're waiving attorney-client privilege so I can file a complaint with the state bar for the unauthorized practice of law. They were really potentially costing my clients hundreds of thousands of dollars just by that simple thing with setting up the accounts. Good news is that bank is no longer around, at least in the same format. And this was about three years ago, so you can kind of do some math on and make a couple of educated guesses. I'm not going to say exactly which one. All right, any other questions before I talk about revocable living trust? Yes? Um, so, like with my daughter turning 18, we've already spoken about things. Now, with her being 18, Obviously, she's not going to have, like, I'm not going to, when she's an, she's an adult, mm -hmm. so let's say if something does happen to me, it's okay that I, nothing is in, written down for that, like that's already arrangements have been made with a family member, or does that still need to be written down? Well, she's a legal adult. Okay. She doesn't have an actual guardian. Right. We're putting backups in well, okay. these documents. In fact, thank you for that lead in. Let me talk a little bit about how I approach the people that you want in these particular documents. I think it's a massive inconvenience and potential setup for conflict to have co anything. And I see this all the time. Oh, I've got my three kids. Can't I make them all co-powers of attorney? Or can I make them co-executors uh, or trustees? They, the reason they look at that is one, they don't want to have to choose among the children as who's first, second, who's third. 
But they also assume, oh, well, if I have three like co-trustees, it's going to spread the work around. No, it's not. If you have three co-trustees, it's actually tripling the amount of paperwork because the financial institutions are going to want everybody to sign off on everything. Now, if you don't trust any one of your three kids, and that's why you're doing all three, I'm like, nope, throw the kids out as people being these agents, and let's come up with other friends or family members that you do trust. <clears throat> so who should you have as your financial power of attorney? or your executor, or your trustee. I keep this simple for my clients, and honestly, I think there are a lot of law firms that make it a lot more complicated than it needs to be. So I really boil all of this down to four big questions. And that first one is, who do you trust to handle financial things for you if you can't? And the scenario I lay out is you put all this documentation into place, everything is exactly the way you want it. You drive out of my office, and you're in a car accident. You don't pass on but you're in a coma for three months. All right, somebody needs to step in, make sure the bills are getting paid, take control of the accounts, keep everything going in a flow so that when you get out of the hospital, you're not left with things being repossessed and utilities turned off and having that big mess. They're keeping your life going. But, okay, if you don't make it out of the hospital, this is also the person who's going to be in charge of making sure that everybody gets what they're supposed to get and when they're supposed to get it. So we're looking for one person. If they can't do it, we have a backup. And then if they can't do it, there's a third just-in-case person. A lot of people have trouble with that last one, but we stop and we really go into it and try to figure out. So you have at least that list of three people. Yes? Okay, so... Say you have your list of people, and the first person you go to them, they don't want to do it. You go to the second one, they don't want to do it. Third person don't want to do it. What do you do after that? At that point, it depends on what we're doing and how we're setting things up. If we're doing the revocable living trust, I usually refer over, okay, whoever is the trustee of the trust, and I put the process for selecting a trustee in there. Occasionally it's a corporate trustee. Now, I would suggest it's worth a conversation with these people about whether they would do something in a crisis like that for you. So out of that list of three people, you're not getting everybody saying no. Yeah, and I can, I'm giving my age away a little bit. I've been doing this for 28 years and it's at least never gotten back to me that my clients have gone through all three people. I've had people who've gone through two, and they're rushing to the office, and we're putting more people in place. But we've never gone through all three. So out of those 28 years, OK, that's a really good track record. So really think about who you want. I also haven't had too many people say, no, I'm not going to do it. So you're pretty sure. Now, here's a little bit of a warning. If you're putting somebody as that financial person, you should expect that you're probably going to be on their list too. So if anything happens to them, you're going to be stepping in to help them out as much as they would be helping you out. All right. Good question. Second big question out of the big four, who do you trust to make health care decisions for you? So it's that same scenario. You're in a, com in a coma for three months. You're in the hospital. Who's the person who's talking with the doctor, deciding on courses of treatment? Are we doing surgery A versus surgery B? Who's signing all of that paperwork that comes along with someone being in a hospital? All right, you have one person. If they can't do it, there's a backup. And if they can't do it, there's a third. Now, with those two questions, Sometimes it's the same list of people, but it does not have to be. I often have clients struggle. They're trying to find Superman or Wonder Woman, someone who can do it all, who has all this knowledge. Look, we know people in our lives who have different capabilities and different skills, and someone who might be really good with money, you don't want them anywhere near health decisions. 
again, giving away my age, I used to say, if you have someone who's making healthcare decisions, but they can't balance a checkbook, I mean, balance his checkbook, so. <laughs> you don't want them handling money, but they'd be good with healthcare, so you can have different people in these lists. Third big question is really the estate piece of it. A lot of times my clients don't like this question. It's, okay, if you pass on, who gets what, when do they get it, and how? The reason they don't like it is they keep killing off their loved ones in these scenarios to see where the money goes. And it's good to just build in some layers of contingencies and just in cases, because we never know what life's gonna throw at us. And then the fourth big question, is if you do have minor children, who's going to raise them if anything happens to you? My married senior clients get a kick when I ask that question and I say, are you planning on having any more children? And you're, they're 65 and 68. No, 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 no more kids, no more kids, okay. So that's the big four questions. One other point, often when we're looking at the who gets what, that third question, if there are younger beneficiaries, you might want to keep something in trust for them, meaning they don't just get the money outright. How many people here can think any 18-year-old, you could just give them $100,000 and they'll do the right thing with it? <clears throat> okay. I actually had a financial advisor, who, and this is going back many years, kept trying to get his clients to come over to me. They had one daughter. And they were like, we'll get to it, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. Well, they ended up dying in a car accident. She was only two months short of her 18th birthday. Well, 18 is a legal adult. And so they had on that stock account as a pay on death beneficiary, the daughter. She has her 18th birthday and she ends up inheriting, I think at that point it was like close to $600,000. You could probably say that's probably about a million or more today, in today's dollars. She sold off all the stock, bought a house that she could really end up taking care of long, long term. Dropped out of high school, married an unemployed 25-year-old man, and still had, well, I have $115,000 still left in the bank. I'm never going to have to work a day in my life. <laughs> That inheritance, it wasn't just that the inheritance was wasted. That ruined her life. So finding a way to have it held in trust for her would have been a much better thing, but okay, they didn't plan ahead. And the default government rule is, okay, you're 18, you're an adult. Have at it. So, now we're talking and getting to revocable living trusts as an estate planning and control thing. How many people here have heard of revocable living trusts? How many people here are familiar with revocable living trusts and how they work? Okay. All right, basically a revocable living trust is a way to keep assets from having to go through the court system. It avoids probate. It's not some kind of magic document that you sign and suddenly everything you own stays out of probate. This is the secret that a lot of attorneys aren't going to really explain. Probate will take anything that's in a deceased person's name when they pass on, run it through that meat grinder of paperwork and inventories and we need copies of canceled checks and all this other stuff, and then out the other side, it gets retitled to the beneficiaries. So that's all probate really is. It's a massive, expensive, time-consuming, frustrating retitling process. So if you're setting up a revocable living trust, you're the trustor, you're setting it up. You're the trustee, you're managing it. You're actually the beneficiary while you're alive. And now everything else that you expect to see in a will, if you pass on, here's where things go, and all the stuff about control. Here's how the successor trustee would step in and manage things for me if I became incapacitated and couldn't handle it. All that's spelled out inside the trust, but then assets end up being titled in the name of the trust. So you're actually changing the ownership of your real estate to your trust. 
And the easiest way to think about this as a concept is as if it were a corporation and you were the only shareholder, you were the only member on the board of directors, you were the only corporate officer, you still keep control of everything, but all your assets that are in the trust, it's like you're slapping a label on it that says it's owned by the trust. So without losing any kind of control, it stays out of that court process for not just death, but incapacity. So this is what actually my grandmother put together for her estate and my father and my aunt, they settled the whole thing within a couple of weeks and it was just done. So that's the revocable living trust. It avoids probate because of that titling of assets. Right. Any questions on that? Right, it's time for me to kind of plug a webinar that I have coming up and it's called Planning Around HD. So it's running specifically through a lot of the things that I talked about here, plus some of the things I'm going to be talking about at the end of Mike's session. And you can register. I mean, you, you've got the handout. If you actually scan that, it's going to take you right to the YouTube webinar. But if you want email reminders, just go to plain English attorney registration.com. Again, plain English attorney registration.com. It'll send you three reminder emails, and then a couple hours after the webinar, it's going to send you here's a bunch of free resources, and it's a lot of the same stuff that's on that handout. Uh, if you do want to look more at revocable living trusts, there's the freetrustcourse.com. That has my book, Estate Planning Basics, in there in a PDF format as well as an audio format. So, any questions? Yes? Um, to have your assets put into a revocable trust, mm -hmm. what is that process like? I mean, how much does it usually cost to go to a bank? Do you have to go through escrow? Do you have to? Oh, no, no. Yeah, if you are taking your assets mm -hmm. and you're moving them into a revocable trust, there's not going to be any cost associated with that with the bank. And in a lot of cases, the stockbrokers, I don't know if they throw on a $25 fee. Usually they don't. Because believe me, any fees like that get people ticked off enough that they're just going to take their money somewhere else. Okay, what if it's real estate? Okay, you've got to file another D, but it's not like you have to have a closing and, like you said, escrow and pay the transfer tax. It's just the $26 filing fee to get the deed registered and then whatever the attorney's charging for that. So you have to make sure as much as possible everything lines up. That's part of the process that we run through with our clients when they do revocable living trust. We actually do a separate meeting to run through everything and say, here's the recommended action for each one of those. But we handle the deeds, and if it's out of state property, we'll just get an attorney in that state to handle it. Yes? So that's personal real estate. <clears throat> what if you moved your real estate over to a limited company? Okay. Actually, if it's in a limited liability company, which a lot of my clients have with rental property, it's actually pretty easy. All I need for me, I just need to check your operating agreement, and it says you're allowed to do that. And then it's just a one-page form that you're, quote, transferring your interest over to the trust. And you're the trustee who's going to keep everything in the same proportional ownership. And you're representing those interests on behalf of the trust. We do it all the time for our clients. So, so the LLC protects your personal assets. Right. So when you combine it into the trust, that's not going to no, that's not going to that's not going to disrupt any of the liability protection. If you think about it this way, you have IBM stock. Okay, what happens if IBM gets sued? IBM can't get to your personal assets. If you own IBM stock inside your trust, it's the same thing, they can't get to it. That's the business separation, and honestly, it's a big value if you're going to have stuff like rental property, have it inside an LLC, it's going, it's going to keep that corporate protection 
just moving the interest is like the same as moving the IBM stock. It's not going to affect your liability. Um, another area, when we were speaking about monitors, Greg areas, I don't have any monitors anymore, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so, divorce situations where you have a few mm -hmm. and you've listed three executors, okay, but none of those executors can involve into a revocable trust, it's in a revocable trust. If it's minor's assets and it's being governed by a court or overseen, maybe it was an inheritance from grandparents or something, okay, that's a totally separate thing. But anything that you're putting into your trust, even if it's earmarked for a minor, your trustee is overseeing it until they reach whatever end you say is appropriate. Okay? Yes? So, question about your revocable trust. Okay. Um, Medicaid plan? Before, okay. That's coming up. Okay. That's coming up in the next session. Because <laughs> your revocable trusts, there are some really good planning things that we can do with your revocable trusts. Okay, I will give, you, give this piece of it here. I often hear from clients, yes, I heard about this great Medicaid trust for moving assets and then it doesn't count for Medicaid five years later. Can I do one of those? Oh yeah, that's great. So you set up this irrevocable trust, you move your assets in. Five years later, it's as if they never existed. You never own them. Oh, that's great, that's wonderful. Yeah, except you can't be the trustee overseeing it. And in fact, technically, you're not even the beneficiary. You have to put someone in charge of your assets and your money to the point that if you want that money, hey, can you get me $10,000 of my money because I want to spend it on this? They can say no. Most of my clients, until they see there's a problem that's going to pop up, they're not willing to give up that much control for that benefit, at least not yet. Yes. Tax advantages for the revocable trust. Okay. Tax advantages for revocable trust. Zero advantage or disadvantage for income taxes, capital gains taxes. It's completely see-through if it's your trust. Now, there's a state planning if it's spouses that you can have something called a credit shelter trust that kind of pops up when the first spouse dies. So you're kind of doubling your estate tax credits. Now, I'm going to tell you this exactly the way I explain this to my clients. I'm using old numbers. Because when I use the actual current numbers, everybody's eyes glaze over. It wasn't that long ago that everybody had $1 million that was exempt from estate taxes. So the biggest mistake that a married couple could make is, oh, I just leave everything to my spouse outright and not use those credits. So when they pass on it, they've got $2 million. Okay, that's a million dollars that's subject to estate taxes. I think I got the number right. $435,800 has to be written out in a check to the federal government for estate taxes. If you had that revocable trust with the credit shelter trust and you put it a million dollars and a million dollars, and then they passed on, let's just say they spent exactly as much as growth and whatnot. No estate taxes, so you can have that credit shelter trust. Now, what's the actual number? Thirteen point six one million per person. I do have clients that have to worry about that at that level. 
But, and this is the big warning, there are a lot of people who have assets that are growing. And at the end of 2025, that number is kind of cut in half. We're actually for estate taxes. It's five million per person in 2012 dollars, and it's indexed to go up. And then, they, of course, they put in a temporary law back in, I think it was 2017, that okay, we're doubling it, and then it goes away. Like I said, at the end of 2025, so the, that doubling goes away. So really, it should still be somewhere around. Probably by that point, seven, seven and a half million. But if you just think about it, if you're investing well, what is it like about every seven to ten years you're doubling your money? And if you're being frugal with the spending, you could end up in an area where if you're not using something like a credit shelter trust for a married couple, there could be estate taxes. You look at that number, 13.61 million or even half of it. The fact is the tax rate, you should just figure 40% of everything above that. So even if you had $100,000 over that limit, well, I have 13.71 million. Okay, the family still doesn't want to pay $40,000 in state taxes if they don't have to. All right, any other questions? Yes. Um, I have a husband that has Huntington's and he's in an uh, assisted living facility. Okay. So he's been there for about a year. So um, then he did. He both of us have done a good job saving for retirement. So we're up in order to pay for it, tapping into the into the four one, you know, the, the retirement. Mm -hmm. So is there anything that can be put into place to protect my assets as long as he's still living? That's a complicated question. There are a lot of different potential answers. But it really depends not just on the dollar values, but what it's in. Now, I'm an attorney, but I am also a certified Medicaid planner. And what I can tell you, estate planning can really be looked at as more of a science. Medicaid planning is a lot more than art. And what I tell my clients is, okay, if you give me a list of your assets and what, what it's invested in, and I come up with a Medicaid plan, it's like taking a puzzle and dumping all the pieces out onto the table and put it all together and go, okay, it's a picture of a horse. Here's what your plan is. Oh, wait, here's one more thing. Okay, we fit that puzzle piece in. The puzzle turns into an apple. It's totally different based on that one thing. Many years back, I had a client who we thought we had everything exactly right. Applied for Medicaid. Apparently, he had a tenth of an acre lot on the side of a mountain that was totally worthless. But he can only have one real estate piece as his primary residence, and they said, you've got to get rid of that before we'll approve Medicaid. Well, how do you get rid of that? Well, we had the documentation that it was pretty much worthless, and a cousin decided, I'll buy it for $100, and they transferred it. But we had to go through that. That one thing held up everything. Any other questions? Um, when trying to nominate like, the guardianship of a child, especially in the, the context of Huntington's disease, so I list one, two, and three, and one might not be suitable 10 years from now. Two might not be suitable for like that. What kind of wordage could you put in there to kind of you know reassess if the person is suitable? Well, this is one of the reasons why we say look well, put at least three people in. Now, everybody would love to think, okay, you put it in place in a state plan and it's done forever. Well no. Things happen in life. Well, this person this. My sister, she would be perfect, and then she got hooked on drugs. She was in out of jail and out of rehab. We need to take her out of that list right now. It's about, on average, every five to seven years that my clients come back to make some changes and update those things, and that's really the best you can do. There's also nothing saying you can't put in more than three people. If one client, and this is going way back, she was the, young, was the youngest of ten children. 
So she put every, every single person in that list. And because she was the youngest and it was so spread out with her parents and the kids, she had two nephews that were older than her. Yep, let's put them as number 10 and 11. So she could put all of those people. It's only when my clients say, oh, I just want one person or two people that I can really push for at least a third. It doesn't mean you can't put more. So going through a much longer list is a much better chance that you're going to get to somebody who can't handle things. Okay. I have one yes. question. If your spouse has an IRA account through a finance company, and it's only one name on that IRA account, yeah. are you recommending that he contact the finance people to have other names on that IRA account, which is only his name? You can't. Not for ownership. Individual retirement accounts are for individuals and you get that tax deferred status because it's the money they worked for and put in. If you say, oh, well, I'm going to put somebody on as a joint owner, tax-wise, that's going to be looked at as if half the money was withdrawn. Can you change the beneficiary if they pass on? Well, yeah, you can. I'm not saying 100% do that. Look, there's tax implications and trade-offs in there. That's something to really look into in more depth. But, yeah, you can't have a joint owner on a retirement account. Is this session over five minutes ago? I kept our people engaged. Oh, wow, okay. All right, so I guess we have a break and then you're coming back at quarter after, is that right? Yes. All right, so Mike will be talking about long-term care and I will talk a little bit about Thank you, friends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right, hi, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm Mike Brooks. I'm from Wilmington, North Carolina, originally. Um, I'm the asset coordinator here in Raleigh for the law office of Jeff Marsacci, and I'm also the founder of my own company based out of Charlotte, uh, Safe Asset Financial. Um, so a little, a little bit about me. Uh, I got started in the insurance industry about 18 years ago. Um, like many, many adults here, uh, my grandfather was in and out of nursing homes, so I had to deal with the long-term care uh, issue during his last few years of retirement. Kind of the bouncing around from in the hospital with Medicare approving a certain amount of days in the nursing home, and then once that time expired, we'd have to bring him home and care for him at home. And while I was dealing with that situation with the family, I was looking for some sort of part-time flexible job because I was helping take care of him. And both my parents were still working and I had lots of younger brothers and sisters that were still getting raised. So insurance popped up as an easy opportunity to be able to work my own hours. Um, so I got in the Medicare and long-term care insurance business in 2006. And that's how I got started. Uh, in 2011, I went fully independent, and then I started working with Jeff in 2016 and got into the estate planning side of things. Uh, so, so today, I wanted to talk about two primary objectives that are focused around care assistance. Uh, one, I think, well, number one is that as we want to age successfully and live independently at the same time. And number two is how do we protect and grow our assets while also having benefits or care assistance planning needs when they come up. A couple of things that I think uh, that are important are on that sheet that you got there are some simple numbers. You know, one in four adults usually spend some time as a caregiver for their, someone in their family. And there's a couple strains, I would say, what we call caregiver strains. Um, I'm gonna look at my notes and cheat a little bit here, but. Um, the five strains that I think well, that caregivers have are one, you know, time. You know, they have to shift their schedules around work in order to care for their family member. Um, 
there's the financial strain where they're usually tapping into either savings or retirement accounts. There's the uh, emotional strain, and um, we have a joke that we use for that. It's like, don't really like to be the number one in my family member's number two business. So the, the uh, social strain, which is lack of being able to spend time with your friends and other family members because you're dealing with the care. And then of course there's the physical strain of you know doing the lifting and the, the, the daily duties. So one of the ways that you can obviously uh, protect your family from these caregiver strains and the expenses are through insurance. So there's long-term care insurance um, has been around since the late 70s, early 80s. And many people, are anybody here familiar with traditional long-term care insurance? Okay. I know a lot of, when I first got in the industry, there were probably, you know, 40 or 50 companies that were actively out there with insurance agents selling these traditional policies where in exchange for a monthly premium or an annual premium, you're getting a daily benefit uh, or a monthly benefit specific to pay for home care or nursing home care or assisted living care. Um, just like auto insurance or homeowners insurance, you're paying for something and if, you, and if something happens, you use it, but if you never use it, then you lose it, so to speak. So that traditional model has that kind of lose it or use it stigma around it where your mom paid for long-term care insurance for 30 years but that lucky jerk she got to fall asleep and pass away <laughs> so that happens a lot too but um, the thing about long-term traditional long-term care insurance is 90% of the companies that used to sell that insurance no longer offer new policies so they're much harder to obtain. There's only a few companies that offer it. Um, you're not gonna find it as like a subsidized, ben subsidized benefit with an employer as often as it used to be. Um, and the premiums have skyrocketed because of the cost of the healthcare and the, the uh, insurance companies just underestimating how much they would spend um, as folks got older. You know, they were kind of counting on people dropping the policies letting them fall off the books a little bit, like life insurance does, but most people were holding on to these policies because they, they understood the need to have uh, that coverage when they got older. Um, the second thing I wanna talk about is the modern form, or what they call hybrid long-term care insurance. So insurance companies are very innovative. They've come up with new types of solutions when, when it comes to long-term care. So instead of having the traditional uh, long-term care pay a premium and in exchange for a certain amount of benefits that you might use, they combined it with other things that people are doing. Uh, how many people in here, show of hands, have life insurance? Most everybody, right? Um, Let's keep those hands up for just a second. Um, how many people with your hands up know or have living benefits built into life insurance? What do you mean? Uh, exactly, right? What are, what are the living benefits, right? Why, why do I not know about that, right? So the hybrid form of long-term care insurance, there's several different versions of this, but one of the easier or most common is they've added the living benefits into the life insurance policy. This is just the standard traditional term life insurance or permanent life insurance. The living benefits could be different triggers, right? They could say, if you have a stroke, if you have cancer, if you have a heart condition, a nerve disorder, muscle disorder, loss of sight, loss of limbs, fire, the list kind of goes on depending on the policy, but they built in these extra living benefits so that if something changes in your health scenario, but it doesn't kill you, that you're still able to tap into the benefit that you have with the policy.
So I was, you know, it's, I think one of the issues with the insurance industry is there's not very many companies that are making this like their standard form of insurance. You know, if you purchase a term insurance policy, uh, most of the time it's like, especially online or through, you know, Facebook ad or through your insurance, your company that offers the insurance for you on your, out of your paycheck. It's just built around a death benefit only. And it's kind of positioned like this is to replace your income and this is to cover mortgages and things like that while you're growing and getting older. And then eventually this policy will expire and when you no longer need it. Well, that's great, but there's also the need, this issue where if you develop a chronic condition or a critical illness that doesn't necessarily result in death, that you still need these large sums of money in order to offset the ability not to work or to look for treatment solutions or to cover the cost of you know, home-based care or skill care. Uh, so these hybrid type of policies, they're done in two main ways. They're either done through a life insurance chassis where you're paying a monthly premium and then in addition to the death benefit, there's the living benefits. The second way is they're using an annuity. So the annuity can be set up for a savings vehicle or a retirement vehicle, but it also has a long-term care benefit. And one of the advantages to that is instead of having to pay a monthly premium that's going to something that may be used or may not be used, you're gonna use this money in some fashion or another. It's either going to be a savings account that you use later, a retirement account that you're using for retirement income, or you're going to use it for the long-term care, or all three. So that's, that's the modern form of long-term care insurance, the more innovative uh, hybrid version of it, right? So um, I think I don't see a lot of insurance companies advertising those type of things. You need to have more of a specialized planner uh, to be able to come across those types of policies. You know, banks aren't really offering it. Uh, State Farm's not gonna sell that to you. Allstate's not gonna sell that to you. They want you on that traditional term policy that they know statistically 95% of the time is not gonna pay out. So when we do our plan, we like to look at the, how do we get rid of the lose it or use it? How do we get rid of the, the high premium scenarios? And, and you know, it's really gonna boil down to what your age group is, but you can maybe look at a term policy for living benefits. Um, you can also maybe look at a more permanent policy if you're older, um, or one of those annuity hybrid policies that's gonna give you some longer term benefits in all three different ways, whether it's retirement savings or long-term care. Um, now specific to this group, one of the concerns I know people will have is the underwriting issues. The, the, the medical questionnaires that can come with these type of insurance policies. So in that case, with the modern hybrid long-term care, the annuities, because you're actually using some of your own savings, they're not gonna have that same type of medical qualification that you would if you were trying to purchase a life insurance policy. So that's one alternative for individuals that may be having trouble on the qualification side. There's also very uh, innovative uh, companies out there that are doing these more short-term short home-based policies. And that's where basically their questionnaire is very simple. It may be that are you currently <coughs> receiving any type of assistance with daily living? Are you currently residing in a nursing home? And if you're able to answer no to those questions, they're not requiring any medical information, any exams. They're going to give you a, a, an approval, and you're going to get a smaller pool of money than you would in a full-blown policy, but you're going to get one to two years of benefits tailored around staying at home. And one of the companies that I love to use uh, because a lot of times with chronic conditions comes lifelong medications, they give a reimbursement 
based on the prescriptions you get filled. So it's, it's a very little benefit. It's $10 for every generic. It's $25 for every brand name. So if you're paying $50, $60 a month for this small policy, and you're filling a couple prescriptions every month, we're sending in the receipts, and they're sending you back this reimbursement, which kind of offsets the cost. So that's one way we're able to get around the, the premium issue and the medical qualification issue when we're looking at trying to provide a, a home-based benefit pool of money um, and protect assets. Um, now this is the, the part where I would say Jeff steps in because one of the things we do on the, in the law office and the care assistance plan is we bridge insur insurance with trust planning uh, in order to maybe set up for Medicaid planning or um, really it's just like an overall better concept of protecting assets for inheritance purposes, beneficiaries, generational planning. So I, with that, I'll bring you up here to kind of piggyback a little bit. Okay. All right, well, thanks, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, talking, I know we kind of teased this a little bit in the last session, talking about your multiple trust, Medicaid planning, long-term care, how does all of that stuff work? But when I sit down with my clients, I say each year, they should be coming in every year just to review stuff, even if it's every other year, okay? I run through exactly what Mike just told us. Here's what traditional long-term care is, what that insurance is like, and then here's these other options. But then, if you don't do that, but there's still this need, now we're talking about Medicaid. Now, Medicaid is based on a couple of things. One, there has to be that medical need. At least two activities of daily living are needed for health to get to that skilled nursing level of care. And that's really where it is, skilled nursing. There's assisted living under that where it's okay, it's a little bit of help. Medicaid's not paying for that, at least not the program that I'm typically dealing with as a certified Medicaid. Okay, so it's that skilled nursing level, the medical need. Second, there really isn't an income test for facility care. So how many people here have heard, oh, for Medicaid for long-term care, oh, you've got too much in income to qualify? Okay, not in North Carolina. And even the states that do have some kind of income cap, there is a way around that that we can do. Basically, when you're talking about long-term care, going to a nursing home, that's the, that critical care. All your income goes to the facility first and Medicaid picks up the difference. So if you've heard, oh, I have too much income to qualify for Medicaid, that's probably mixing it up with Medicaid paying for care at home. There is an income cap on that type of care, which doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense for me if you're thinking about it with government it's like well wait a minute there's a house and they're taking care of the food why wouldn't the state want to pay well look the rules are the rules maybe that'll change down the road for now for that facility level of care income doesn't matter the biggest thing is the asset test and this is where Things are so frustrating for a lot of my clients, particularly when we're doing the Medicaid planning for seniors. They've worked their whole lives, they've built up all of this money, they need this care, they've been paying their taxes in, and it's like, oh my gosh, I have to spend everything down to below $2,000. Have you heard of that, that $2,000 limit? That's just your liquid assets. You're allowed to keep a primary residence, and they're happy to tell you you can keep your primary residence up to around 700000 in equity. You can't get a $2 million mansion and still qualify. And then it's 2000 in liquid assets, and you get a vehicle, and you'll still qualify for Medicaid. Now here's one thing the Medicaid office will not tell you. Even if you, oh, you qualify, you've got your primary residence, that's okay. Yeah, Medicaid's gonna put a lien against the house for everything, so you're not really saving the house if the amount that Medicaid pays out exceeds the value of the house. So you pass on, you're leaving that to your family, oh, they get the house, yeah, but they get the lien from Medicaid for every dollar that they paid out. All right, 
So how do we get around this? How do we preserve more assets so that not only are you having money that can take care of the extra things that Medicaid doesn't pay for, or your family member gets this extra money, and yet you're still qualifying for Medicaid. Here's the easiest thing, and I mentioned in the last session, this becomes more of an art form than a science because it really does depend not just on how much you have, but in what you have, and we can convert things. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the rules, but here is the, the perfect plan ahead, make sure that it happens, save 100% of everything you want. We call it the two trust solution, even though there's technically more than two trusts. There's an irrevocable property trust and an irrevocable family trust. Any real estate, you put into the irrevocable property trust. It's just a little bit different. I'll talk about that. Any liquid assets or other things you want to preserve, you put it into the irrevocable family trust. Five years after you transfer that stuff in, it's off the books. Medicaid doesn't see it. Or if they see it, they can't care about it. It's as if you never owned it. Well, that's great. That's wonderful. Why don't we just set that up? Well, okay, here's the thing. You can't be the trustee of your own trust. Your spouse can't be the trustee of your own trust. So usually for my senior clients, it's like, are you ready to give up control of everything you own, usually to one of the kids as a trustee, to the point where if you want to get some of your money out, they can say no. Oh no, I don't know if I want to do that. But that's the step that you need to take. So yeah, we can set up these irrevocable trusts so that it preserves stuff. Now, let me talk just a little bit. The rules of the irrevocable property trust that's a little bit different from the family trust. Right. The person whose assets are being protected, we're taking all their liquid assets, putting it into the irrevocable family trust. It's written into the trust. They are not the beneficiary. Okay, it's their money, but they're not the beneficiary. Well, how do they get the money? We craft it so that the trustee is the beneficiary while the person's still alive, while the couple's still alive. So they can take the money out, put it in their own pocket, and then turn around and give it back to the person. So it's the kid taking the money out and then giving it to their parents or paying for things for their parents. It can never pay directly out of the trust to pay for the person or give it to the person. It's got to be two steps. What about the irrevocable property trust? It's real estate. The person retains the right to live in the property and the right to any income that's generated off of it. Usually this is their residence or there's a vacation house. They're not renting it out. There's no real income. But what does that actually do? They can live on the property and they get the right to income. You're familiar with the capital gains tax in, on real estate. You sell real estate, bought it at 100,000, you sold it at 300,000, there's $200,000 worth of gain. If you pass on and someone inherits the house and they sell it for fair market value right away, there's no capital gains tax. Well, that's a benefit we'd be getting rid of if we just put it into that family trust. But retaining the right to the income and the right to live in the property, they say that's still part of your, quote, taxable estate, which means it gets bumped up to fair market value. So when the family turns around and sells the house, it's fair market value as the date of death. However, for Medicaid's rules, oh, you just have the right to the income and the right to live in the property? That, that's not enough that we say you have to spend it down. So we're really straddling these two sets of rules with this irrevocable property trust, so real estate isn't going to slam your family with capital gains taxes. So, okay, back to the gym. Broad overview. You're moving those assets in five years later, it's done. Okay, that's the ideal plan. Does everything go ideal? No. So now there are other creative rules that we can work with, but I think just talking a little bit, I don't want to go too long. How many people have heard of the five-year rule? What exactly does that mean? Okay, the five-year rule means any gifts within the last five years, Medicaid will look at, 
and say, oh, this is going to incur a penalty period. So this might not be the accurate number this year, but for every $6,500 that you give away to someone or put into the trust, during that five-year period, you're eligible for one month. And so, okay, well, if you gave away $65,000 within that last five-year period, you apply for Medicaid, they go, okay, well, you're qualified except for those gifts. We're not going to start paying until 10 months later. Okay, what if you gave it away five years and one month ago? It just totally drops off. That's gifting. And this is where a lot of people sometimes get stuck. It's not gifting if you actually purchase something. And the easiest way to understand this is, look, if you had $2 million and you flew out to Las Vegas and you put everything on one spin of the roulette wheel and you lost, if it's not a gift, it doesn't count for Medicaid's five-year look-back period. So if you have that in mind, you realize, okay, there are transactions you can make that aren't going to violate that five-year rule. All right. So what are some things that we could potentially do at the last minute? Now, I know this is being recorded. This doesn't apply anywhere except North Carolina, because different states have different rules. We use this all the time. I'm not necessarily expecting this rule to be around forever, because there are a lot of states that say you can't. In North Carolina, for Medicaid recovery, it's based entirely on, quote, probate. So if assets are owned joint with a right of survivorship, it automatically transfers to the other joint owners, and so there can't be a Medicaid lien placed on property. And any property owned without a spouse, so anybody other than a spouse, Medicaid says, well, that's, quote, unavailable property, because they will not force someone to sell them an asset if it's not the person looking at Medicaid or their spouse. So it's off the table. Okay, here's one, one thing that we did, and I tell this story all the time just because it worked out so well. Uh, this was the mother of some clients. She was in a care facility with memory care. She didn't really have anything. She could feed herself, clothe herself, you know, she could do everything for herself, except her short-term memory was completely shot. You couldn't let her outside, or she just, she'd wander off and get hurt. So she needed to be in that supervised environment 24-7. Okay, she had a good pension. She had a survivor's pension from her husband. She had Social Security. They were only spending about $6,000 per year in order for her to stay in this environment because all of her income was covering a lot. But we knew if that level of care went up even a little bit, suddenly it's gonna eat through her assets. So what exactly did she have? $340,000, just rounding it up, in a checking account. Because they, when, you know, her husband died, she needed this care, they sold the house. She also had this life insurance policy that had about a $60,000 cash value, but it had a $400,000 all right, Medicaid looks at that. They don't care about the death benefit. It's just the $60,000 in cash value. So $400,000. If she had gone to Medicaid and said, hey, what do we need to do? Oh, you need to spend $398,000 and then come back to us. Well, okay, what do we do? Daughter and son-in-law had a house. It was $500,000. And the mortgage was paid off. Well, mom's allowed to have a primary residence. So we didn't want to get rid of the life insurance policy because that $400,000, that's what she wanted her kids to inherit. She had four kids, that's, this is the inheritance. But they need to get that cash value model. How did they do it? Son-in-law took $60,000 and bought the policy. Okay, so now mom has $400,000 actual cash. We set up a contract. She bought 80% of their house. And now the house was owned by mom, dad, I'm sorry, daughter, son-in-law, and mom. Three of them joined with the right of survivorship. Mom owned 
Son-in-law owned 10%, daughter-in-law owned 10%. Joint with the right of survivorship. So when mom passes on, they get their house back. Well, okay, they bought that portion of the house, $400,000. But what did the daughter and the son-in-law do? Well, look, morally, this is mom's money, even though we sold part of our house. They took the money and put it into the irrevocable family trust. There's no five-year look back because that was a transaction she was allowed to make. So there's $400,000 in this irrevocable family trust. What's the first transaction they do? They buy the insurance policy back from the son-in-law into the trust. So within a couple of months, we filtered everything through and asset-wise, she qualified for Medicaid right then. So there are different techniques and things we can do, but it is very highly dependent on what those assets are and not just what the values are. So this is where long-term care planning kind of becomes a little bit more of an important one. Is there anything I'm missing? Yeah, I would say, we talked about this earlier, that sometimes it can be, um, when you're faced with a crisis, like uh, long-term care, it can be kind of like shocking and, and uh, you were making the point that, yeah, it can be, it can have a cost to do this type of planning. Um, but don't just necessarily seize up and put your money into the bank and say, all right, I gotta save everything because I'm gonna need this for care. Hire an expert to talk to you through and do this plan because at, if you're seizing up, you're really just pinching pennies and leaking dollars. Yeah. Because they, yeah, the cost of the plan is there, but you, like you said, it costs one month of care to put the plan together, but you save six months of long-term care expenses. Well, you're you're coming out much better ahead that way. Yeah. In this case, it was like four hundred thousand dollars. Right. Yeah. Go ahead and open it up for questions. You got uh, got some time. Any questions? Yes. Sorry, what? Does it take an attorney to set up a trust? If you want it done correctly, <laughs> and it's not just any attorney, you've got to be familiar with this. And this is one thing that I've kind of found. <coughs> there are a lot of attorneys out there that they say they do estate planning. They actually do a lot more probate work, and so they live and breathe in those estate rules to the point where they go, oh, Medicaid planning? I don't want to go into that. It's a whole other set of rules, and it's a whole other set of liability, and they don't want to. Are you an attorney? I am an attorney, and I am a certified Medicaid planner. So yeah, I draft these trusts. In North Carolina, can I help anyone outside of North Carolina? Well, yeah, as a certified Medicaid planner, but there needs to be an attorney licensed in that state or state's trust. And you're taking on new clients. Yes. <laughs> I'm taking on new clients. He's here. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. The capital gains tax. How long does that come up? Capital gains tax? Is that what you said? For a gifting money? Okay, yeah, let's talk about gifting and the capital gains tax. When you gift something to someone, it comes along with your capital gains tax basis. So we use that house, the example of the house, it's worth $100,000, and then it grows up to $300,000. So if you gifted that house to a family member and $300,000 they sold it, they're paying those capital gains on that $200,000. It always comes with the gift. If you own it when you pass on, it gets bumped up to fair market value. That's not just with real estate. If you gift stock to someone, that also comes along with your capital gains tax basis. So if it was stock at $50 a share, and now it's $100 a share by the time they want to sell it, the recipient, they've got those capital gains taxes on the fifty dollar gain. So if it's gifted before you pass and it's greater than five years, it's more years. I'm sorry. Thank you. 
it's greater than five years, I, I don't know what that five year rule is. The five year that. rule is what does Medicaid count as gifts for qualification? So nothing to do with capital gains. Nothing to do with capital gains. This, that five year rule, this is, this is kind of getting to doing it yourself, and this was just such a heart-wrenching case because there was a son and two daughters, and the son thought he knew everything. And so he's like, okay, there's a five-year look-back period, and I heard that there are these gifts that you can give that are exempt. So, okay, he planned out everything down to the penny based on mom's projections and whatnot. It's like, okay, we're gonna gift all this stuff to me and my two sisters, and then uh, we're going to have these annual gifts that are excluded, and he crunched the numbers down and got to the very end, and he heard, well, Medicaid takes two months to process an application, so at four years and 10 months to put in the application. No, no, Medicaid counts from the date of the application. So when they go back five years, they saw all of those transfers. The other thing he got wrong is that, have you heard, oh, well, you can give $18,000 a year or whatever? That's gift taxes. That has absolutely nothing to do with Medicaid. Medicaid does care about those, even if the IRS doesn't care about the gift tax part of it. So, no, it's everything that was gifted within that five-year period, it counts for Medicaid. So, we, when we put together Medicaid plans and we have assets that get transferred, we kind of put the date of that last transfer into our system so that we can see exactly when five years is up and it's like, okay, we're clear. If they need care earlier, well then, okay, that's when we may be pulling some money out of that bureau of the trust to get them through whatever that last period is. It's a little past the five years. So the capital gains tax is regardless of when it was gifted. Yes, regardless of when it's gifted. Okay. Any other questions? We've got time. Oh, you're just fixing your glasses. Okay, sorry. Any other questions? I'd just like to make a point. I mean, Medicaid can be a tool in the quiver as can long-term care plan. Yeah. It, it, it's important. Most individual situations will dictate what is the best plan of action for the individual to take. Yeah. And then you can tailor a plan based on the various tools of the quiver. Medicaid is not a be-all, end-all in itself. Right. Especially when you're talking about a long-term care facility because certain facilities that will not accept Medicaid, the quality of care may differ versus facilities that do accept Medicaid. Medicaid, yeah. Is that a fair point? Yeah, but let me also make this point, because this has happened in the past. If you're getting long-term care insurance, this was another thing that just it drove me crazy. We were trying to get a veteran's pension benefit do work in that field too. It's just that the planning also really fits well with the Medicaid plan and everything in general. So it was the same two trust solution, and it's like, okay, this is how we want to set stuff up and move it in. And you'll some of some old rules, you've got that VA pension benefit right away. Now the VA has a three-year look back period and we were doing this. And so they had long-term care policy. It was the father, he, they, this policy was paying out like 9,500 a month for home care. Why was it that much? It's because he was a really, really big guy. And they needed two large built male caregivers that he would respect to actually keep him in line. Because if he got upset, he could cause a lot of damage and his wife was like, this tiny little thing. There's no way she could have been that caregiver. So this was 24 seven. Hey, the policy paid for all that. But they came to us, hey, there's only about two months left on this insurance, what do we do? Well, the ideal thing would be, go back in time four years and 10 months. 
and put the assets in them so the five years of your insurance is running concurrently with that Medicaid five-year clock. So if you get long-term care insurance, and I tell this to my clients that they've got a great five-year policy, great. But if you start to tap into that policy, we need to revisit the whole irrevocable trust and gifting thing to make sure you're not caught like these clients were at the very end of it going, what do we do now? Again, if, you're, if that five-year Medicaid clock is going concurrently with your policy paying out, that's ideal. Okay. What other questions do we have? For me or Mark? Of three years. The, just very quickly, the VA pension benefit. This is actually designed for the assisted living care level or home care level, not the skilled. If you actually are spending more money than your quote unreimbursed medical expenses, which if the doctor says, okay, you need to be in this assisted living care environment and get your food and everything there, okay, that counts as unreimbursed medical expenses. So if you're actually, your income doesn't cover that, the VA will kick in this pension benefit, I think it's somewhere around $2,300, dollars a month, if it's done right. So it just automatically happens. And you used to be able to just take, meet the asset test by, okay, we're gonna move this stuff in now, and then the next month you're clear. The VA put in a three-year look back period now, four or five years ago. Now, for long-term care, if you're a veteran, they will find a facility for you. They will take care of it. But it's whichever facility they can find. It could be 200 miles away from your closest family. But they will find a facility for you. So this is why even my clients who are veterans would do this type of planning even though they know the VA would actually take over and provide that long-term care if they needed it at a VA facility they don't want to not be near their family. So we'll do this plan as well. I want to add something that um, you have a great point there about the, the Medicaid. It's, it is a potential tool in some scenarios, but it's not the ideal tool. <laughs> like it's, you would probably prefer to stay at home, um, have a choice of where you go, um, and Medicaid doesn't give you that. Now, if you're already in a place, sometimes they're willing to allow you just to stay there. But if it's if it's like okay, I've only I've already spent everything I have. I'm down to Medicaid. It could be basically wherever they want to place you, semi-private. Um, another thing about the long-term care insurance that is not widely known to the policyholders. Um, unless you have a very good advisor is there's two really different types of ways they pay their benefits. There's what they call reimbursement based and then there's indemnity based. Now what that simply means is you might have a policy that you've held for many years and it's built up to a payout monthly of say $9,000 but you're only at the point where you're getting about $4,000 worth of home care and there's some other things you'd like to do but it's very limited for those services like maybe home health aid or something like that for just standard chores around the house and so you're kind of come out of pocket for that yourself because a reimbursement policy would reimburse you for the 4000 that you're spending with the, the skilled nursing care and, and the therapy groups that they cover. An indemnity policy would just pay you the entire 9,000 benefit that you, you've built every month regardless of what your actual expenses are. So that frees up an extra $5,000 out of the insurance company's wallet to do whatever else you want to do while you're in that time. Make yourself a, a much more comfortable lifestyle. So again, we're only going to recommend indemnity based type of benefits for our clients. There's just no reason not to have that versus the reimbursement. It outweighs it every day. I just want to make one more point because there's a, this big stigma that 
oh, if it's a Medicaid facility, it's bad. If it's private pay, it's good. There are some really, really good facilities that are 100% Medicaid, and there are some really crappy ones that are private pay, and it's just knowing which one is which. So part of what we always look at when we have clients and we're looking at Medicaid planning and we're at the point where, okay, we need a facility, we have a geriatric care manager we have access to. They know what the different facilities are, what they do, what they're good at, what they're bad at, which ones take Medicaid, and they can kind of help narrow the search down to three or four that you can go to and, okay, this is what's probably going to be appropriate for your particular situation, and this is good. If you were going to buy a house, how many houses do you think you would have to look at before you figured out which one you wanted to buy? Well, okay, multiply that by 10, which is how many facilities you have to look at before you really, really, really know. That's a lot. So if we can help with my team narrow that down to three or four, that's just pure value. That's part of what we do as well. All right, well, I just want to make sure that everybody's uh, got the information from before. I think we have, there's uh, planning around HD. It's a live stream that I'm doing a week from Monday at 6 o'clock. It's on my YouTube channel. Uh, there's a little uh, code. You just click it with your camera. It takes you right to that, uh, that live stream. But also, if you go to Plain English Attorney Registration, It'll send you some reminders in that link you get plain English attorney registration. I think that's the way of telling you. That's your cue. That's your cue. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much.